Well, welcome to the translation. So this is our last astronomy talk after we had a lot about pictures and now we are doing it differently with sound, with gravitational waves and someone who's really an expert is Benjamin Knispel and his favorite stars are neutron stars and he al already discovered a few of them and he has been doing research in gravitational waves and you are the best to tell us how to do that. Benjamin, thank you very much for the introduction. Moin from Hannover. And, and I will give you an overview of uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Who has read the abstract? Abstract knows that it's a, a current topic. It started about six years ago. And until then, astronomy was done with only, in quotes, with telescopes. So we looked into the uh, universe uh, captured electromagnetic waves and uh, other parts and but it was really so to speak um, a silent movie and what we do with gravitational waves is we add, add sound to astronomy or to uh, give us sound where we cannot see anything and what we can do with that i want to explain to you a little bit and show you how these instruments work and what we can learn about the universe from that. If it's about uh, gravitational waves, so I've, maybe I heard about that, but what is it really? And of course, it's an important point that we understand that in the beginning. Gravitational waves are vibrations in space and time and a consequence from the general theory of relativity. So the general relativity, you can play, explain it with food and uh, and jello and of course the the green jello because it's the only uh, delicious one and what we know from uh, the theory of relativity from einstein from 1915 is that space and time work a bit like this jello like um, space and time uh, in, in every day we experience them as static things the space seems to remain the same but in very big scales and, and isn't isn't so. And in 1915, Einstein figured that out with his theory of relativity. And we really have to look at four-dimensional space-time. And you cannot really picture that. But uh, three in three dimensions, you can imagine it's a bit like this jello. And space and time, or space-time, this changes if there are masses. And without jello, it's quite obvious. If I add an apple to it, put an apple on it, it changes the shape uh, of this jello around the apple. And that's exactly what uh, the theory of relativity said. Masses change space and time in their vicinity, or mathematically speaking, it changes the geometry of space-time. So space and time are curved. With jello, it's quite obvious that something is curved. And, but uh, what we see as a consequence is what we used to call gravity, because everything follows the shortest path in space-time, and if the geometry changes, then the shortest wave is a different one. And uh, there are different shortest waves when masses are there or they are not there, and that's just simple Einsteinian gravity. And what also happens, as Einstein found out, if masses are accelerating, then the space-time itself is also a vibrating. And if masses are moving accelerated, then the entire space-time starts vibrating, and these vibrations uh, move at the speed of light through space and time, and we call them gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves give us a new sense for experiencing the universe. And they are a bit like listening in the universe, like sound waves in the air. Gravitational waves are vibrations of space-time caused by accelerating masses. And they um, expand at the speed of light. And these vibrations in space and time, they can really move through space without any limitations. And every mass that is accelerating, we will see that it creates that, and we will see that we need big masses, in fact, to, to be able to see that. But if masses move accelerated, then it, it creates vibrations in space and time. And without any obstructions, they, uh, they come here and arrive here, and we could, in theory, detect them that if they come from inside the... The, the Earth, and we can we can 
really detect them here. It, as, I, as I said, accelerated masses, and if I shake my fist, uh, I create gravitational waves, but in the, in practice, uh, signals that we can detect uh, can be only created by um, very big masses. So what are the kinds of gravitational waves that we can see? One, there are pairs of uh, black holes, binary black hole systems. It's a very small, very massive object. If we have two of them, they circle around each other, and this is an accelerated movement, and they create gravitational waves. And it could be a binary system of neutron stars. And I explained a little bit about neutron stars or other very compact objects. And they can also create gravitational waves, or we can have a black hole and a neutron star circling each other. This also creates gravitational waves. And all these three kinds in the upper row, uh, we have seen uh, the, some of these and detected these. And there can be neutron stars that are perfectly round and rotate around their own axis. And supernova explosions in our own galaxies, they, we know that they create gravitational waves, but we haven't seen them yet. Maybe they are too rare that we could then see them regularly. And then there are the three question marks. There can be other sources uh, of which we don't know anything. And that would be really cool if we could see a signal. And this is real, and we have really detected it, but we don't know what it is. So that's where, where science is really exciting. Um, and now I talk about the main actors here, which will recur in our talk. One is neutron stars. Neutron stars and black holes create in these stellar explosions. If stars that are heavier than our sun at the end of their life uh, collapse in their core, uh, they create a heavy iron core and it becomes so dense that it, matter cannot remain stable anymore and collapses further. And if it's big enough, it creates a neutron star. And you can see this artist's impression here is the blue-white sphere, uh, comparing it to the city of Hanover. There isn't really a neutron star, of course, because then the Earth would have gone away. But the neutron star is about the size of Hanover, is about 1.5 times as heavy as the sun, or maybe twice as heavy as the sun. And it is in a very small volume, it's only 20 kilometers in diameter, which means the density of the neutron star is as dense as an atomic nucleus. And because the, all the empty space in, in normal matter, it has been squished together. And that happens when a neutron star is created. And we know that some of them rotate up to 700 times per second. This is a, a lot much faster than a mixer in our blender in our kitchen. So because they have already extreme magnetic fields, so I really love these objects. They are among my favorite stars because there's very matter in a very extreme state. And our universe uh, gives us these things that really we can't create in the lab. And if this Newton star, star that's it's stable, but if more matter is added to it from, from another star in the vicinity, and then there's much more then you cannot create physical pressure from the inside, so the, the matter collapses even further. And according to the theory of relativity, it collapses to a single point that is called a singularity from a very simple black hole that is not rotating. A black uh, hole has very few properties. It has the properties in one point, and then there's an event horizon, that's the distance at which, beyond which you cannot escape anymore, you needed to go faster than the speed of light to escape. And the event horizon separates the universe into two areas, um, outside and inside. And if I'm beyond the event horizon, I cannot escape because everything that goes into it vanishes. A black hole has a size. This is the so-called Schwarzschild radius. It's one of the two formula in this talk. There are constants. This R is the Schwarzschild radius. Uh, from it can be calculated from the gravitational constant g and the sp uh, speed of light squared and the mass of the black hole. So the heavier, the bigger, but they only have really three properties. They have a mass. If I know the mass, then I know a lot about the black hole. And they have an, a spin, an angular momentum. It, they rotate around their own axis because the matter that falls into it may rotate. And in theory, they have an electric charge, but in nature that doesn't really happen because the star that collapses into a black hole is electrically neutral. So black holes are really boring. You have only 
three three numbers, uh, mass, charge, and spin, and whatever falls into the black hole, um, and in the end you can describe it with only three numbers. And these are the numbers that we the, the things that we can observe, and we can really measure things about these gravitational waves and about black holes. But black holes are black; we cannot see them, and we have only a lot. We don't have a lot of means to detect them except by gravitational waves. So neutron stars are very small, and even if they are hot, they are not very bright. Maybe I just can't see it, and uh, I cannot really uh, find out a lot of them just from the light alone. It's a, so now back to our gravitational wave and back to the shaking jello. So what are the effects? that this will have obviously it doesn't have anything to do with the taste but rather with the physical attributes and properties that we can take a look at so we want to take a look at the actual effects and the stuff that they do so imagine you're in a vacuum and you're free falling and you have you you construct a circle made out of small masses and um, it's gonna levitate in, in or fall in that circular form and if a wave goes perpendicular to the screen so perpendicular to the to the thing then it would this is this is an exaggerated image of what would happen. It would extend and be squished in horizontal and vertical directions. This is the effect that the gravitational effects have, and this is the the thing that we have to measure. So these dimensions are obviously exaggerated enormously, and in general, these uh, changes in the length are. Uh, a very a very minuscule effect, but the, the longer the or the, the bigger the, the areas that I observe, the bigger the longitudinal change will be. So the relative change of lengths for the strongest gravitational waves that we can expect is 10 to the minus 21. So of any given length, uh, a billion of a billion of a thousand. And this means that the, uh, the, the orbit of the Earth would change by one atom. So this means that we would need to um, measure the, the distance of the Earth circle the, traveling around the Sun up to uh, one atom exact, which is obviously ludicrous. So this is the, the um, formula that we're going to look at, and it has it's the so-called quadrupole momentum on the right side. And what makes it this constant or this this coefficient so small is the one over uh, the speed of life to the fourth, which is a very large number. So whatever you're going to have in here is going to be tiny. So we need an enormous amount of energy in order to have any noticeable distance. And it also changes with the distance from the source. The further I am away, um, the harder it is to detect. So what we need are these so-called laser interferometers. I send a laser through the um, divider, and it's going to be reflected by a mirror on both of the streams, and it goes back into divider, and then it's going to be overlaid again. And depending on the transition of the phase or in the in a change of the phase due to the different lengths of the axis, um, I can see if they extinguish themselves or I get back, added back up, basically um, measuring the length of the distance that I've run by the, exting by, by the uh, change in the luminosity of the, the laser. So of these laser interferometers, there are pretty much five around the whole world that are being used in use right now. There's one that is underground, so I don't have a pretty photo like this. They all have the same type of construction. 
they have just have a very long running or pipe or, or distance that they can the light can run along and then go back so the geo 600 is the one on the left on the top that's the one that our institute is running it's in germany it's south of hanover the focus is developing the technology it's always been like that because we are the smallest of these types of installations with only 1.2 kilometers the next one is uh next to Pisa. So remember, the longer it is or the, the bigger it is, the, the more sensitive the whole construction is, the better I can measure. measure sorry. And uh, the Virgo is in Japan and uh, the LIGO one is in Livingston. So to give you a, a short idea of what they will measure, so the, the relative change in length is the 10 to the minus 21. You can always uh, get it slower or you can get it lower if you look at something smaller. So the, the total change of length is 10 to the 18, minus 18. It's a, a small fraction of an atom. So obviously that's hard to measure and we need a lot of technical tricks in order to see something. But the question is how can we how can we achieve an even higher sensitivity? And at the very end, these, um, these installations that we have are currently very sensitive to frequencies in the audio range. So I can actually legitimately claim that this is somewhat similar to a microphone for a gravitational wave. I can actually hear them in the in the truest sense of the word. I, I can actually hear what they sound like. These detectors now listen to the cosmos and they're obviously very sensitive. This is the one example. These, these are the spectra that we measure. One of the last campaigns of our measurement in 2018 that was uh, prematurely ended. Uh, what you can see is there's a frequency of the audio spectrums. This is a, a fairly thin chunk of the audio spectrum. And you look at the blue and the red ones, those are the ones on the bottom. On the y axis, you can see the spectral density of a gravitational wave. And the, the higher up you go, the, the deeper is the. We need to get this. Uh, the curve down because the higher up you are, the more you get background noise. And the strongest gravitational waves that we can expect would roughly be at the level or below of that green line. And the frequencies are commonly in the medium frequency ranges, so about the 1000 hertz range. You can see there is a pretty decent distance at that at that frequency between um, the green line and uh, the measured spectrum. So there, that's something you can measure, decent signal to noise ratio. And usually there's a, a campaign, there's a lot of measurements with some breaks in between in during which we try to improve the detectors and the measurements. And we have started measuring 2015. We've done three campaigns since then. And the last one was ending in March this year. So we've measured a lot. And the question is, what have we measured and learned from this? This is the mass masses of the stellar graveyard. Those are the remains of some uh, stars that exploded and that we've measured. These are all the ones that we measured. So the, the distance between the axes, the heaviest ones in the middle are over a hundred times the mass of the sun. There's a smaller dot on the bottom that's, that's about 60 or 80 masses of the sun. Those are two um, black holes that are orbiting each other and are uh, merging into one. So in the middle at around 60 solar masses, above that is 100, and they 
merge to one of about 160 solar masses. This is a typical signal that we can see on th of these merging black holes. We have f seen 90, so we have lots of these uh, merging black holes. That's the main the main objects that we see. And you can see orange spheres there, that is lower masses. They are the so-called neutron stars. They have just maybe about two solar masses. And there are two neutron star mergers, mergers uh, merging to something, probably a black hole, but we don't know exactly. And there's also some where there uh, were mergers of neutron stars and black holes. And the red and blue are um, they are black holes that we have seen directly, the black and the yellow ones. And now I will summarize shortly. Uh, so Einstein was wrong because during his lifetime he doubted that his solution to the relativity theory of relativity, that black holes would exist in nature. He said um, he wrote papers and he said, no, the nature will not allow the creation of these objects, but we see things that behave like black holes. So he wasn't right. But of course, on the other hand, he was right because his theory described gravitational waves. And we know that his theory predicted the gravitational waves exactly, which is a bit boring because one was hoping that that one might something new. Um, um, but we, the Properties of black holes can be measured directly, for example, the mass and the spin in some cases. And we can see, uh, give a, maybe what's the typical population of black holes? How heavy are they? How fast are they spinning? What are the relations of the masses? And so, and this is what we know about the entire population of black holes and how that works. I want to show a few examples about that. And uh, the signals have these names like GW. 150914, and that's just the name of the gravitational waves from the year 2015 in the ninth month and in the 14th day. So it was found on the 14th of September 2015 was the very first signal that we detected. And what the detectors really measured, this is only very little uh, adjusted and edited data. We can see that it was about zero. 0.2 seconds of data was in red from one LIGO detector and on the right side in blue from the other LIGO detector. And the y-axis shows the strength of the signal um, in the, the strain in units of 10 to the minus 21. At 0.3 seconds, this wave starts developing and it rises in amplitude and in frequency to about 0 0.43 seconds, and then it stops. So if you listen to that, it's about whoop, and this is the typical sound from merging merging objects. They circle each other and uh, circle faster and faster and get closer and closer, and this gravitational wave um, is emitted and then they merge to a single object that doesn't emit gravitational waves anymore. And if you see, if you get an identical signal of both detectors and the red wave had been, had been, has been time shifted and mirrored, and if they get the same, you can see that it's probably a real signal uh, with statistical methods. And from the shape of this wave, you can uh, deduce what had happened. And we know that two black holes of about 30 solar masses were merging. And we can demonstrate that. And there's an online tool where you can test it. You can, for example, um, what the, um, the sensitivity is, and you can make change the data, the input the input parameters, and you can change these sliders here. On the left is the total mass and on the right is the is the distance. And if you think you have found a good match to these to these two curves and um, and then you can see the total mass around sixty four solar masses and sensitivity is one point three uh, billion light years, and you can find a good match of these two curves. But of course, we have some noise from the detectors there, and there's a discrepancy between the theoretical and the measured curve. But you can very simply uh, detect the properties, and the spin may still change the curves and so on. 
but you might get the impression that nothing much happens here because the signal is so tiny, it's 10 to the minus 21. So a one thousandth of an atomic nucleus is the, is the shift in length, but we can look at the energy of this event. And from this paper, you can look at the mass of the first black hole and the mass of the second black hole and what uh, assume a relativity is correct. So what is the mass of the final black hole? And you can see around three solar masses are missing. So of course they are not missing, but they have been they have been radiated out as gravitational waves, which means three solar masses according to E equals MC squared have complete been completely been converted into gravitational waves in these 0.2 seconds. And it is the the event with the highest luminosity in the entire universe and it is in the the peak is makes 50 times as much power as all stars in the universe but it, except for our detectors it is completely invisible and we can also see where it came from because we have two detectors like we here have a sense of direction with two ears we can see roughly where it came from but another question to which we found um, answers is where does the gold in the universe come from? So gold is very important culturally and economically. And one thought for has thought for a long time that elements like gold and platinum, as I have circled here, uh, basically have been created in the merger of neutron stars. This is just the periodic table of the elements. And uh, in the in the beginning, there were only the blue ones, helium and, and uh, uh, hydrogen. And then in massive stars, they create the light, the light yellow parts. But most of the heavy elements are created in the merger of uh, neutron stars. And so far, it was only a theory. But if we look at merging neutron stars, uh, we can verify it. And merging neutron stars do several things. They create gravitational waves and they make a gamma ray burst. And then there's an explosion cloud that uh, cools down because of the radioactive decay and if you wait a little bit you can you can see the afterglow of the shock wave uh, of the gases but if you really could observe that in all the details one could really see if uh, if it really is about the creation of heavy elements and that is exactly what we can do and what we did and we have one gravitational wave signal in 2017 uh, detected by LIGO and Virgo, where uh, we found gravitational waves that really said oh, these were was the merger of two neutron stars. And was there a gamma ray burst that accompanied it? And indeed, there was the uh, merger of the neutron stars. And 1.7 seconds later, there was a detection of a gamma ray from the Fermi satellite in an Earth orbit. It could be... Um, just chance, but we can make a stellar chart. And the sphere that you see is the Earth is in the middle, um, and this is the entire sky that we can see from the Earth. And from the data of LIGO and Virgo, there's this little green cucumber where it says LIGO Virgo, and somewhere here in that region, the neutron star merger took place. And the Fermi observation of uh, another gamma ray satellite is where the light blue and dark blue areas overlap and this overlaps perfectly with the gravitational wave area so this gamma ray burst was with high probability from this neutron star merger and the little delay isn't caused that that by gravitational waves being um, sub, uh, superluminal but um, that the event takes a while to to develop and we can search for galaxies that have uh, shown up after this explosion. And after 11 hours, this succeeds. This is what you see on the right. That is about 130 million light years away. It's uh, the, the new sun popped up that is marked with the cross here, the crosshair. And if you now look at the explosion or if you, at the cloud that is left by the explosion, then this is uh, colored in a way that the way it would look like. So if you look on the left side, this is a nova that you see on the left. This is an archive image. You don't see it yet. And this is um, before the explosion.
This is where it would be. And now if you look at the time lapse on the right, it shows up this explosion or the, the cloud of the explosion and it shows up, it will, it becomes less luminous, it becomes more red, it cools down and you can now follow this for a longer time and after about 11 days you cannot see it anymore. On the right you see the spectra, so the energy distribution or the luminosity across the spectrum. On the left you have the visible spectrum, on the right you're in the deep infrared and you can see there are obviously some yeah some some peaks for example between 0.8 and point, uh, 1.2 these happen because you have the presence of heavy metals like platinum that absorb certain frequencies what you can do together with some models that we have that gold, platinum, and a few other elements uh, originate in these um, in these neutron stars that are merging. Most likely, those are just um, the, the the remainder of the beginning of the cosmos. So, at the end, a small overview of some highlights. Obviously, I cannot uh, discuss all the 90 signals that we have, but some that are very prominent. For example, from a certain date, there was another neutron star merging with surprisingly heavy components in total. This could be an early suggestion or hint that there are neutron stars that are heavier than we know or are aware of. So we'll observe that some more and hope for some better results. Uh, up until April 2019, the uh, black holes that we saw usually had a very similar set of masses. And we were actually starting to expect that this is always the same. And this was the first time that there was a big uh, difference between the masses of the two black holes that were merging. And another thing that's very special here is that there wasn't just one frequency of the gravitational waves, but overtones that you would expect but you haven't seen before. And then on the in 2018, we saw a medium-sized black hole, about 23 times the mass of the sun, and it um, merged with a, a nine times a smaller object. It could be a very light uh, black hole or maybe a neutron star, we're not entirely sure yet, but we're sure there's going to be more of these types of signals in the future and then maybe we can figure out what the other type is that it merged with. And in 2019, again, we saw the birth of a medium-sized black hole. Medium-sized is anything that is below about 100 solar masses, so still quite heavy, but between 100 and 100,000 masses. We weren't exactly sure if they actually exist. And here we have a conclusive proof that it exists and that it was the merger of two smaller uh, black holes. And just one thing, you can participate if you want, if you're interested in this, there's one thing that's called Einstein at Home. It's a distributed voluntary um, computational project. You donate your computer, or rather your the time that your computer is running while you're not sitting at it, in order to search for neutron starch and there are different searches. The most important one is the gravitational wave search. It's, um, we're, but you're also searching for radio waves for gamma ray bursts. We, by doing that, we found 80 more new neutron stars that we didn't know about before, which is quite a sizable portion of the one that we know about. And if you want to join, you can go to einsteinathome.org. It's uh, mostly open source. You can check the source code. We're also happy if you find improvements that you want to suggest. And if you come from the other side for the um, observing, there's uh, an app called Chirp. Do you see the URL below? We it shows you live uh, when there's a new gravitational wave that has been observed. 
And you can, for example, see the afterglow of, melt, of, of merging neutron stars. But so starting 2022, you might even be able to get push notifications to your phone so that you maybe if you want to get up at night and then observe the event as it's happening. So I'm already just saying thank you and open up for questions. And the, I want to thank you for the very understandable and very interesting talk. Very well explained. There's a lot of questions. And so the first we saw the detection of the sound. So you can, if you normally do this, you can uh, see something about the shape of the room that the uh, sound originated in. Is that the same for gravitational waves? Okay, if, if I hear something, I can see, I can hear how big the room is and what the room, what the room is is like, and some maybe know that that light is deflected by masses, like this is called gravitational lensing effect, and that is also true for gravitational waves. For example, if between me and my gravitational wave source there is a heavy object between it, then the gravitational wave will go around the object on both sides and maybe um, use. Uh, different times, uh, and you can figure out the mass of the object in the middle. And for gravitational waves, we cannot yet do that because we only find that maybe every five days or so. But in principle, from this direct line of sight, uh, we can fi figure out something about the line of sight. And we can also figure out something about the uh, shape of space-time itself. For example, we can figure out how fast the universe expands. This is uh, interesting for cosmology, and it's interesting for um, figuring out what the universe really is like. And it's something new, and we can fi figure out the Hubble constant. And because there's still a huge uncertainty uh, about that, but uh, it's not really a big surprise. But uh, So nothing surprisingly f wrong has come out from this, but also nothing else, really. How many uh, properties does the neutron star have in addition to those of the black? So we really don't know what the neutron star is like in, in, inside. Uh, it's the the density is really about as, as dense as nu atomic nuclei, but it changes inside and maybe a centimeter or a millimeter at the surface is an atmosphere with lots of electrons and there's a there's an outer crust maybe there's heavy nuclei but the further you go into the middle uh, there's there's mostly the neutron soup that's why it's called neutron stars because really uh, only neutrons survive this really and and but maybe if there's exotic matter that like quark matter or something like that inside we really don't know so in the end to describe a neutron star there are lots of um, state equations if there's pressure like this and then it has this diameter and this mass but uh, this is unknown and we really don't know and if you really if, if you if you will there are millions of parameters that you can tweak but if we know from the gravitational waves the exact mass and so and so, then it has been deformed by tidal forces from its partner, then we know something about these state equations. And in a few cases, we have done that at our institute. They have measured how big it has been. Uh, prob probably, of course, there are error bars, um, but there are lots of additional parameters because we really don't know. But it's still matter. It's not a black hole. Is there a way to theoretically gain energy from gravitational waves? Yes, in theory, because they interact a little bit, otherwise we couldn't detect them. But uh, the coupling to, to matter is very, very weak, so it's not really practicable. You can see how much effort we we have to to, to detect these. And yeah, they they leave a little bit of energy in the Earth, but I don't know... Uh, it's it's single digit joules maybe something like that so so better just do some more research with it. so yeah it's for the research but for energy sources but in science fiction maybe maybe something like that but they, but they can also then create gravitational waves maybe I have another question about the measurements 
um, there a theoretical maximum to the precision that you measure? Yeah, so in the end, the end if, you, if you make the, the legs of the measuring uh, too long, and if you, but what you really do, you have a resonator, it's a trap for light or, or a store for light maybe, which it goes back and forth a few thousand or a hundred times, and then you can increase the, the precision. But if you if you make it too long, and but if you make it um, too long, and then while the, the light is still bouncing around, then the gravitational wave is already uh, through and has already gone through an entire phase, so you can't really, can't really measure it. So you can increase it, but there's also, like in electrodynamics, you really need an antenna that is roughly in the size of the wavelengths of the gravitational waves that I want to measure, or maybe maybe shorter, but not a lot longer than the wavelengths, because you can get uh, maybe interference. So, but you can measure lower frequencies if it's really huge. Um, so then you need really huge detectors. There's an, um, in maybe in the 2030s, uh, there's a projected uh, detector in space where you have lower frequencies and longer lengths. Okay, this already answers the next question about the wavelengths. So, so the laser is just over a thousand nanometers. Okay, how can you uh, prevent that minimal changes in the position of the reflectors and the lasers change the measurement? So the, the mirrors are decoupled from the nice seismic events. You have really high vacuum and it, it's, uh, it's uh, damped and uh, actively and passively and, and on, a, on a triple pendulum and then there's a pendulum suspended from the roof and, then, and another mass and another pendulum and three triple or quadruple pendula really de decouple the, the detector from the movement of the Earth by a factor of several million. And so what, what we are really interested in uh, is really very, 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 very still and doesn't move. Okay, so a nice engineering solution. Also made a remark about the ART. Is, is it uh, compatible with quantum theory and where does it break down? Yeah, so that's one of the problems. In the black hole, we have this singularity where all the mass is in a single point that contradicts the quantum theory and you can't really um, have finite mass in an infinitely small point. And so it conflicts with relativity. And there are other things that happen at the event horizon with destruction of information, which also contradicts theory of relativity, oh, sorry, contradicts quantum theory. But maybe we can see in black holes, we can see the first contradictions to relativity. We haven't seen it yet, but that doesn't really mean anything because we can't measure precisely enough. But maybe in the next years or decades, maybe we can find something. Okay, so the next question is, are there any more uh, gain the knowledge that you expect to come next year. So there's a huge, there's a team worldwide, uh, several thousand people uh, working on this, um, on the engineering and on, on different aspects. But um, we continue doing that. We're doing more astronomy together with other astronomers. Uh, something that we have done very well in this one case where we see, saw something about this neutron star, this uh, will happen more regularly. There's one big breakthrough would be that we could see continuous gravitational waves with an uneven neutron star that rotates. That would be a great lever to learn something about neutron stars, and that would really be a breakthrough because we don't know a lot about that yet. Or we could see the signals in, we see some deviations that cannot be explained by relativity, and then we would really have another good lever to to um, modify maybe relativity. Maybe this version would be more correct, or but it's just speculation at this point. And maybe we can find signals from very early in the universe, maybe with a space detector, LISA, where we can see the reverberations of the Big Bang, maybe something like that. That would be great. Very cool. That would be nice. So, okay, I have one last question before we go into the extended Q&A. I actually assume there's quite a few more. 
So there, black holes are very rare. So why is it that coincidentally some happen to upon each other? Yeah, they don't really meet by chance. They have have been a binary st stellar system before that, and maybe one of them goes supernova and becomes a black hole, or they overlap each other. So, but in the end, they create into two. They evolve into two black holes circling each other, or it may also be. Uh, individual black holes in a very dense environment, for uh, for example, a, a uh, and maybe one star is being kicked out, and then two others then uh, still circle each other and or or merge each other. But we don't really know how these are created. But maybe in the future we will know more about that. Okay, I'm I'm piqued. You piqued my interest. Um, so uh, anyone who's interested, uh, you, you now know where to work on. And thank you for your time.